Hey everyone, welcome to You Said What, where we look at the most memorable conversations and written interchanges in our lives. Today's guest is James Haggerty. James is the obituary writer at the Wall Street Journal. He writes three obituaries a week, but they're typically not about the business tycoons or famous inventors or other kinds of folks that you might think a publication like the Journal would write about. Instead, James has consciously decided to write about interesting, non-famous people. James has also written his own obituary already, not because death is near for him, but because, well, we'll talk about it in our conversation. Welcome, James. Thank you. It's great to be here. Before we get into our conversation, I want to thank our sponsor, Pioneering Collective, an executive thought leadership firm combining personal PR, coaching, and networking to transform hard-earned wisdom into heavyweight impact. You can learn more at pioneeringcollective.com. I ask every guest before they come on to think about a really memorable and important conversation or written interchange in their lives, something that has stuck with them, maybe even changed their worldview. Let's talk about yours, James. Uh, it concerns your, your previous wife from whom you were separated at the time. Tell us about it. Okay, well, in trying to write my own life story for the benefit of perhaps my children or a few friends, um, I've had to go back and think about my whole life and try to figure out how I can explain it. And one of the things I, would, I need to explain briefly is uh, what happened, what, why did I get divorced when I was young? And so that I've been thinking lately about that. And uh, what happened is that I got married too early, like a lot of people, and eventually separated from my wife. The problem was that I couldn't make a decision and so things went on for several years with uh, us separated and uh, me failing to decide exactly what to do. Meanwhile, I got entangled with other people. And during this period, one thing that really struck me is that uh, friends never really called me out on my behavior. I really wasn't behaving right because I wasn't coming to a decision. And that was creating problems, not just for me, but for my wife and other people. And I, I just kept hesitating and waffling. And it struck me that friends never really mentioned this. They just sort of accepted it. Uh, and I, sometimes I wondered, well, why is that? You know, why, why don't they? Did they not even ask you about it or they asked you about it, but sort of in glancing questions or did they just avoid They, the they would ask altogether? about it, but they wouldn't. That, that was it. You know, they would just accept it. And I kind of, th I kind of knew in my mind that um, that I was sort of misbehaving in a way, and probably needed to be uh, scolded. But people don't really want to get involved in that kind of situation, and they so they tend to just accept whatever you say. But finally, after several years of this, a friend came to visit me, and he had he was a mutual friend of, of me and my wife, and he had just seen her, and he sort of asked me what was up with me. And I kind of gave him the same line about, you know, not knowing what I should do and still thinking about it. Even though you don't want to live with somebody, it can be hard to totally cut off that person, somebody you love uh, like a family member. And I knew that divorce would be sort of a final break in our relationship. But instead of just listening to me, as everybody else did, I nodding his head, he just said, Bob, you've got to get a divorce. And he said it so vehemently it kind of broke through the fog in my brain. And within a few weeks of that conversation, I finally took the steps I needed to do to get a divorce. And I think it came as a relief to everybody. Uh, it was still painful, but it was what really had to happen. And if I hadn't had this conversation, I don't know how much longer I would have continued waffling. But it made me think that we are, we're pretty sensitive about not intruding on our friends' lives. I tend to avoid things like that. I, I t if, if there's a sensitive uh, subject, I tend to skirt around it. But I think there are some times in our lives where we really need somebody to be frank with us. And at those, those are the times when you need a friend to step up and take the risk of telling you something very pointedly, even if it might cause some anger or some hurt. I guess it's a delicate act because it's there we all know people who don't hesitate to do that. And they do that probably more than they should. And then, as you say, it's the, the temptation is to do that less than you should. And it's hard to kind of pick your spots, isn't it? 
That's true. Yeah, I mean, you, you could easily do it too much. Uh, I think you have to be aware of the situation. And, and I suppose if I would have just told him to go to hell, he might have backed off. But I think he knew that I needed to have something told to me very bluntly. I think he sensed that, and he did me a good service. Have you, is, that a, is that a learned skill, or is that a either you can do it or you can't do it, have those tough conversations with your friends like that? Do you find that you do that you know, when the moment's right for other people in your life, or is it are you sort of admiring that someone else was able to do it, but you're still learning how to do it? Or Yeah, I, I can't remember being in the same situation. I think I would hesitate, but keeping in mind this experience I had, I hope that I would, in the appropriate circumstance, try to do the right thing. Let's talk a little bit about obituaries, which are so interesting and yours are so great to read. When you write them, you've written, I'm sure, hundreds, thousands at this point. When you when you think about all the lives that you've learned about, what are some of the things that you've taken away from what matters, what doesn't matter, what people think matters? When you talk to people about a life writing obituaries, what are the lessons for you? One of the lessons relates to what I was just talking about, about talking about sensitive topics. Because typically when I write an obituary, I want to talk to a member of the family. There are certain things only the family knows, date of birth and where the person grew up and what his parents or her parents did for a living. Uh, So I always try to talk to the family. And often when I ask for, I ask a public relations person, could you you alert the family that I would would like to have a chat with them if they're willing? The PR people come back and say, Mr. Haggerty, you understand that they're grieving They need some space. And I say, yeah, I know that. But in 90%, more than 90% of cases I find, they really do want to talk to me. And the the reason they want to talk to me is that when you're grieving, you find it comforting, A, to know that the story of your loved one is going to be preserved, B, that it will be accurate, and C, it is just comforting to talk about that loved one. In the past, if I knew somebody who had recently lost somebody, and I met that person, I would avoid that topic. I'd say, oh, I can't mention Joe because I don't want to reopen wounds. But now I realize that often those people, that's exactly what they want to talk about. They want to talk about the person they just lost. That's, I think, a sort of way of keeping that person with us. When they start talking, are there certain things they tend to want to talk about, or does it really depend on the person? Of Well, family members, I mean, I think they often... They really want to stress all of the good things about the person they've lost, and that's understandable. Uh, they want to make sure that um, I understand what a wonderful person this was. Occasionally, they'll also mention some of the person's flaws, but I think they, they just want to talk about it. And they, they want the story to be accurate, obviously. How do you deal with the flaws, uh, either if they cite them or if you, if they don't cite them, but you're kind of wondering if there are any, we'll talk about how you decide what to include and not in the obituary, but how do you feel like you're getting complete information in these slightly unusual situations where, you know, they're in a vulnerable position and they're obviously grieving, as you said. And so um, it's not like you're interviewing the governor or trying to hold their feet to the fire about about a piece of policy or something. It's it's a little bit of a different, more personal situation. How do you make sure you're getting the full picture from them? Well, I try to go gently. One problem I have is that many people think an obituary is like a eulogy or a tribute. And so we're only going to talk about the good things. They don't understand that a newspaper obituary is different. It, and and we, we write about the good and the bad. Uh, so I, I try to explain that to them. And I explain that I am going to talk about things that didn't work out, if they're important. But I'm going to try to do it in a fair way. If something bad happened, I'd like to know what your loved one said about that. What he learned from it. Whether he had a different interpretation of it. And I, I make clear that I'm also going to write about the good things. When you think about the obits that you've written, are there examples of flaws that are bad things that ended up being prominent or important to you in writing those obituaries? What kinds of things would you include? And what kinds of things wouldn't you include? Both sides. Uh, this wasn't exactly a flaw, but I wrote about an executive who had run a major food company and as part of that, uh, as part of my research, I sent an email to Princeton University to, to just confirm that he had graduated from Princeton in a certain year. And Princeton came back and told me that, uh, yes, he did, but at that time he had a different last name. So I said, that's interesting. Uh, so I called up his daughter and said, well, why is this? Is he had a different name when he was at Princeton? 
And she explained to me that he came from a Jewish family and around when he was in college, he was told that having a Jewish name was going to be a major disadvantage in his career. This was back in the 50s. And he decided to change his name, which was pretty controversial in his family because his father was very active in the local synagogue. They, they were very religious. At least some of the members of the family were very religious and felt very strongly about not hiding their Jewish identity. But he changed his name and he lived for another 50 years or so. And almost nobody who knew him was aware that he had changed his name. So now I had a dilemma. Well, how am I going to explain this in his obituary? I thought, well, I have to explain it because if he did this, it shows how very serious it was, how um, severe discrimination against Jewish people was. It was a sign of the times. It is. It was a sign of the times. And it must have been a very important decision in his life and something that affected the rest of his life. I didn't think, see it as anything shameful. I saw it as something quite understandable, uh, but I included it. When my story came out, it shocked some of his friends, and uh, at least one of them was furious at me uh, for revealing something that she said he didn't want revealed. His daughter was also upset with me, but later on understood why I had done it. So this is a case where in, if you want to tell the full story, you're going to upset some people. But I, I make a judgment about whether it's important to understand the person I'm writing about. These are so interesting. Do you have another example for us of either something you included or did include that was less flattering? Or I shouldn't say in the case of the one you just gave, I don't know that that's flattering or unflattering. It just happened, but something that some people might consider unflattering. I wrote about another businessman whose son had been involved in a very gruesome insurance fraud case that involved the electrocution of a horse. And this was not, I was writing about the father and not the son, but I decided to include a brief mention of what had happened to his son because it was something that had been written about on the front pages of newspapers across the country at the time, long, long ago. And I thought, if something like this happens to your son, it's a major trauma in your life. And so I thought, I'm going to write that he endured the pain of of this experience. I wrote about it briefly. I didn't make it, I didn't put it at the top of my story, but I included it. And at least one family member was furious at me for that. I made the decision that it was an important part of his life. That can be a tough decision to make. When you write the obituaries, do you often find that there are people who are close to the deceased who get in touch with you and say, not so much about whether it was unflattering or not, but just you're able to tell them things that they didn't even really know or appreciate about the person. What really struck me when I started writing obituaries was that when I talked to the children, the grown children and people who have died, how much they want that story to, preserve, to be preserved, but how little they often know about the story. You will talk to somebody's son and say, well, I noticed your father went through dental school, but then he became an organic farmer. Well, why did he decide to change course in that way? And they say, wow, that's a good question. I never <laughs> thought about that. And you'll say, okay, well, do you have any stories about your dad? You know, just give me a sense of his personality. Do you have any stories about him? And they'll say, oh, there are millions of those. I say, oh, well, just tell me one or two. And then they often draw a blank. Now, obviously, they've been told good stories. But when you're told stories, you're not taking notes maybe retain half of the story. And half the story is often pretty worthless, whereas the full story can be precious. So this is uh, what got me on my current mission of trying to persuade people that they should put down, preserve in some way, their own stories, whether they write something or record something, because there are certain things that only they can explain. There are certain things that only they know. And you want the original version of the story. You know, you don't want the half-remembered, vague version of it. You have a, um, a new book out called Yours Truly, an obituary's writer's guide to telling your story, which is just what you're talking about here, and really advocating basically that people sort of pre-write their obituaries, which is super interesting. I used to work at the Associated Press for years, and we had all these 
canned obituaries, I guess lots of news organizations do, of famous people, and you're always hoping they don't get inadvertently sent out before the person dies. But mm -hmm. I've never heard of regular people writing their obituaries. Um, but I, I love the idea, and I know, um, you know, I'm grateful in my own family that there's there are some written versions of family stories and multiple stories within those broader families that have been passed down that I now have copies of, and so and my kids will have, and so the hard work's been done. But it means that. 10 years pass and you forget certain details or you wish you'd ask somebody questions that there's a, there's a certain amount of it's all there um, in a nice, easy to digest form. So I totally appreciate it. How do you get started on this? If you, if I wanted to start writing my obituary, just writing my, my story, what's the process for doing it? Well, first off, I, I used to tell people you should write your own obituary. The more I think about it, I don't like to use the word obituary because it's a word that people understand in different ways. Most people, when you say obituary, they think of a little notice that's going to appear in the back of the paper or on a website, and it's going to have a few names and dates, the survivors, and details about the funeral service. And that's really nothing. And people don't know why they should worry about that. And they probably shouldn't. What I tell people now is just save your best stories. Don't think of it as an obituary. It might, might go into an obituary, but just save your best stories because sooner or later, your children, your grandchildren, your friends, somebody is going to wonder about you. My dad, for instance, uh, when my dad died, we just did a very basic obituary on him. It was accurate. It included all of his jobs and the awards he won, and the date of his birth, et cetera. But it didn't reflect anything about his personality. You know, it was a generic. So, and I, I wish that my father had written down a little bit about what he thought about his life. I don't even know why my dad decided to become a journalist, even though that's pretty important to my life. I can't remember if I ever asked him that. And when I, when my dad, when you asked my dad a question, he tended to give you a very brief answer. But we should have tried a little bit harder to pull that story out of him. And he should have tried a little bit harder to, to share it in some way. You know, that could be a few paragraphs. It could be a book. It could be a recording or a video. It could be some excerpts from letters that you've saved in a file. It could be social media, media postings that you saved. You know, out of that 1,000 postings you, you put out there, probably two or three are worth saving. Uh, and they're, gonna be, they're all going to be lost if you don't find a way to collect them into a little file called My Story. So what about, like, with your own life, when you think about it, you obviously have done a lot of thinking about it. What do you feel like it's important to explain to your kids in the way that your dad maybe didn't fully get a chance to explain to you about things like why he chose the career he's in, having written about so many people's lives and understanding that sort of the connective tissue, the stories, but also the context around things and what resonates. What would you think in your life just thinking about it? What I want to know is not just what they did, but how and why they did it. And I want to know what mistakes they made and then what they learned from them, what obstacles they faced and how they got past those or didn't get past those. And then I want to know about some of the key decisions people make in life. For instance, how did you get on a certain career path? You know, why did my dad want to become a journalist? What, what inspired that? And then how did he get there? And I'd like to know, well, how did you decide to get married or not get married? And then how did that work out? And I think more generally, to get started, you can just think about three questions. What am I trying to do with my life? Why? And how is that working out? Well, the last one's kind of a deep question. That's it's like it's it's requires some real honest. It's not just factual. I did this and I did that. I hear I like this. I like that. It's kind of like you have to ask yourself: Is it really working out? This is why I tell people that don't wait until you're on your deathbed to try to start telling your story. Start when you're in your teens or your twenties or your thirties, and think about these things periodically. You know, if we all sat down for five or 10 minutes even every six months and said, what have been, what am I really trying to do with my life and how is it working out? It would be a good way to see whether you need some kind of an adjustment, see if you can improve the narrative a bit. Do you think the the bigger obstacle to doing this is on the part of the questioners of this, let's say the kids in this case of not asking enough questions, not being inquisitive enough, not making time to get the stories, or is it on the part of the the person who's recounting their life and not being willing to being interested in making the time to to go back either because they're not interested or it's painful or whatever and go back and sort of recite those chapters 
I feel like there's a lot of situations where obviously there's gaps and I it's and maybe there's no one answer to this, but it, it feels like the shortfall can happen on either side. And I'm curious if you feel like it's more one than the other. Yeah, there, there are plenty of reasons why people don't record their stories. First, I'd say that a surprising number of people actually do write a very interesting reports on their lives or record them uh, more than you'd expect. But a lot of people don't. And there, there are a variety of reasons. One may be, a big one is people say, well, I'm not famous. Who's going to care? You know, my kids aren't interested in all that. And, you know, as a parent, you often have that impression. And it's often true when your children are teenagers or 20 or even 30. But usually as they grow older, they grow more curious about where did they come from? Why am I like this? And why am I, were my parents like that? So it can be a matter of thinking nobody cares. But just remind yourself, somebody may care, even though you're not famous. I care about my dad's story. Samuel Pepys was not famous. Uh, Anne Frank was not famous. They happened to write some interesting things about their lives, and people are still interested in those. Now, that's not going to happen to all of us, but I think there's usually going to be at least one or two people who are interested in your story. I met a guy who was a janitor. Uh, he was attending a seminar where people were learning to write their own obituary, and he explained that he was writing his obituary for one person. He said he was estranged from his sister. He said, my sister doesn't know me. I want her to know me. So he was writing for an audience of one. I might be writing for an audience of two or three. I don't know. That's one thing to keep in mind is that there probably is an audience out there. And even if nobody ever reads it, there's you. Thinking back on your life and trying to explain it for most of us is actually comforting. There are some people who just can't stand the idea and they can just skip it. But I think for most of us, it is rewarding to think back and understand better what happened to us and why. And we should start doing that when we're young. There are lots of other reasons people don't do it. They'll say, well, I hate writing. Okay, well, then you can record something. They'll say, you know, I'm too busy living my life to write about it. Well, that's a great answer. That's a great excuse. I'm having a fascinating life. I just don't have time to write about it. But actually, you probably do have time because it doesn't take very much time. All you need to do is schedule maybe 15 minutes once or twice a month and jot down some of the things that have been happening to you and what you think about them. And when you have a really interesting experience, make sure that you preserve it in some way because 20 years from now, you're not going to remember it very perfectly. So it doesn't take a lot of time. You wrote a great, I should add here, a, a, a beautiful obituary of my dad um, when he passed away. And it was, it was funny because we always used to, my brother and sister and I always used to joke about how little my dad talked about himself. Not He was a law professor, not so much after he became a professor and as he hit his 40s and 50s, he would talk about that stuff if you pushed him a little bit, but more his early life. He grew up in Germany and was forced to leave because of the Holocaust and came as a kid speaking no English to this country. And so it was interesting. Your obituary captured a lot. And I, and I realized in, in hindsight, we did know quite a bit about him. I, you know, as a kid, sometimes you never know enough. And, and particularly when they've passed, you kind of feel like those, there are those gaps that you didn't see as gaps at the time. But I guess everybody's in a different situation in terms of how much or little they know or how much or little was left and in terms of storytelling. So mm -hmm. having, having something, not, not a James Haggerty quality obituary necessarily, but any kind of obituary is a, is a real um, comfort, I think, to people because it does give you something to connect with a after the person has passed. Right. Uh, and, and one thing that uh, many families try to do is sit down, mom or dad or Uncle Jack, and ask them some questions and record it. Maybe they'll just say the voice. Maybe it'll be a video. The problem is that they don't really know how to ask questions. They're not journalists, obviously. So they'll ask a question. They'll get an answer. That's recorded. And then they just go on to the next question. The problem is when you ask people a question, you usually don't really get the answer the first time. You get part of the answer maybe, but usually not a satisfying answer. So you need to ask the question again and clarify things until you get as close as you can to something that will make sense. And you also have to think about, well, will somebody in two or three generations understand this? Because if I'm talking to a friend or my sister or my mom, you know, I'll just say, well, remember that time... <laughs> 
we were at the lake and uh, Shirley fell out of the dock uh, and broke her leg. You know, we all understand the context. But if my grandchildren should read that or great grandchildren, they'll say, well, what lake? And who's Shirley? And what happened to her? So you've got to think about explaining those kinds of things, especially when they're important. So what I recommend is that people not only ask the questions and record it, but they re-ask the questions, and then they make a transcript on paper, and they try to clarify that by adding in little notes where needed. Another reason to make a transcript is that technology changes. So the device you use to record it may not exist, probably will not exist in 10 or 20 years. So you've got to find some way that you can keep this precious document. Speaking of technology, you know, the younger generation is, live their, lives their life on social. And I'm sort of wondering what the future of obituaries is or what, what the futures of obituaries will be with, with everything being so transparently displayed. Like now that you can, my kids are teenagers now that their whole lives are on TikTok. Will you even need an obituary? Wouldn't you just be able to, there'll be some, I'm sure, not too distant future, some easy way to sort through all of those years and years of posts and curate and create super cuts and all different kinds of stuff. And so I'll just be able to like, just like on my phone now that it, I can, it'll suddenly pop up my, my best photos, my memories from three years ago, like the same thing will happen. W will I need yeah. someone to curate it? Will they need to curate it? Well, I think they need to curate it. That's a, it's a very good point. I mean, we do, it's great that we save a lot of stuff. Now, most, I would say that 98% of what we post on social media is pretty worthless, but the 2% that's worth saving, let's find a way to save it because in 20 years from now, People probably will not be using TikTok or Facebook. They'll use something else. And even if you can go back and look at TikTok or Facebook or Instagram, I don't think people are going to look through 20,000 messages to find the one or two that are worth reading. So you should do that. You should save the ones that you think are important to tell something about your life and put them into some kind of a file, whether it's digital or on paper, maybe do both and curate them yourself. It is a great opportunity. There are also lots of companies out there that provide software nowadays that helps people tell their life story. They prompt you with questions and they, they can arrange to print your story with pictures. There are all kinds of different apps you could use. Or you could just do like I do and sit down and start Write typing. Yeah. You told me at one point that you wrote letters home for 30 years, I guess weekly? Yes. At Which least. is extraordinary, I mean, given that, you know, that's such a dying art, but also just the thought of all the information in real time that's in those letters. I spent a couple of years in Japan and I wrote a lot, a lot of long letters home. It must have been a painful experience for my parents to sort through those, but it was interesting oh, to, go back, to go back over those. I can't imagine 30 years of that, though. What, when you go back and look at those, what do you see about yourself? What, what did, was there a lot of stuff you didn't really remember? You remembered not as well as you should have, or did it? come together. Yeah, there were some things there were some things I didn't remember at all. Some things I remembered differently. Stories that I had told many, many times and I realized that the story had evolved over the year. Not intentionally, but you try to simplify it. And, and then you start getting it wrong. But you think the latest version in your head is the right one, but it's not. I happened to write all of these letters because when I was young my mom said civilized people write home once a week. And that was one of the few times I wisely listened to my mom. And my mom happened to save all these letters because she didn't move for 60 years. So I was lucky. I've got this huge archive. Uh, and not many people are going to do that. But letters are another great way to save a memory. You don't have to write them every week. But if something really interesting happens to you, why not write a letter or an email or a, a long text and share it with somebody? Because you'll make that person's day. But then also save a copy for yourself because this is something interesting and important that could go into your my life file do you still write letters or have you have you retired after 30 years <laughs> i'm writing fewer i i to my regret it, you know i email my mother once a day oh, and wow. so i feel like at the end of the week i don't have anything left to report but i should i try to write them now and then and i think it's important to write them uh i find that sometimes i sit down to write a letter and i think i have nothing to say one thing leads to another. I find out I did have something to say. What do you think the difference is between if you have something, let's say the important that happened to you this week, writing in a diary versus say writing a letter to a friend? I mean, obviously, if you write it to a friend, you kill, kill two birds with one stone and you're reaching out to a friend at the same time you're documenting something. But is there a different thought process of 
writing in a diary versus writing a letter, you think? There, there would be, I think. Uh, in a diary, you'd probably be more honest, but you also probably would write in a shorthand that wouldn't make sense to a lot of other people, maybe not wouldn't make sense to anybody. The advantage of writing a letter is that you have to explain things. So uh, great if people did both. So much to talk about. Anything else I should have asked you that I didn't ask you that we get a chance to cover? I love I loved this conversation. Thank you. I don't think so. I'm going to get started on my documenting my story soon. You should. I, I hope that my memory is still sharp enough. I guess that's that's another excuse that people use to, to not yeah. do it. This. I think yeah, people should do it in small chunks. You know, don't try to sit down for 16 hours and write your whole life story. Just sit down periodically, once every couple of weeks, maybe for 15, 20, minutes, two hours at the most, and write about one episode, and then come back later. Uh, it will add up. And between your between writings, ideas tend to well up in your head. My daughter said to me the other day, actually me and my wife said, she said, why don't you ever tell us about your childhood? So maybe she's begging for us to write some stories down too. It sounds like she's, she may be the first audience, maybe the only audience, but. Very interesting, yeah. You gotta, you gotta come through with it for her on that. When you think about it, it's one of the best gifts you can give to your friends and family. and. It's something that only you can give. And when you're gone, it's gone. Your memory is gone. So you've got to get it down. James, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's great to see you again. And also fantastic. I should have said at the beginning, you and I used to work together. So this is a bit of a reunion. Thank you for coming on and sharing all your wisdom. Well, thank you for having me. I've long been really fascinated by people who chronicle their lives, people who have a record of what they did every week something you can reflect back on later in life, or maybe, who knows, pass on to your kids. I was just talking to someone the other day, who someone who's in their 40s, who's written in a diary every single day of their life, which is extraordinary to think about. Of course, I'm just too lazy to have committed to something like that over the years. So I have letters and things like that, and emails, of course, but nothing consistent. I like James's idea of just trying to capture some key stories and answer some of the important questions uh, in your life. I think it's a good compromise, and he gave a good roadmap for how to do that. You know, there gets to be a point where it's just too late if you haven't done it. I know with my in-laws, they hit their 80s and got into their 90s. We talked a number of times over probably five or 10 years about doing a sort of an oral recap of their interesting lives, and we never got around to it. This is definitely one of those cases where something is better than nothing. If you've got a cool communications moment that had a big impact on you, email me. I'd love to feature you on the show. If you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe to You Said What. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you next week.